We now come to a time in our service in which we're going to celebrate communion, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. It's my high privilege to introduce you to a friend of mine, Rabbi Daniel Thompson. The rabbi and I shared an airplane seat some couple of years back, and it was a wonderful moment for me. I hope it was as wonderful for him. I was uh, seated on the window seat and reading actually out of the book of Joshua. And he was, we had the seat empty in between us and then he was on the aisle seat and I, I heard him say, so you like Jewish authors, huh? <laughs> and that began a wonderful conversation in which uh, I came to know and appreciate this dear friend and his love for the Torah and then was pleasantly surprised to discover his love and trust in the Messiah as well. And he is in town this weekend from Traverse City, Michigan. He uh, oversees a congregation of saints and has come here on other matters. Uh, he has a wonderful family. And uh, when, when we had a great conversation on Thursday in my office, I asked him if he would be kind enough to, to help us understand a little bit more of, of communion from a, from a Hebrew perspective. We all have been, by God's grace, grafted into the nation of Israel and we could not learn enough about our Hebrew heritage into which we have been adopted or brought into and sometimes when I sit with uh, Rabbi Thompson I almost feel like I'm sitting as close as I ever will be to the Apostle Paul the Rabbi himself of course our master Jesus was called Rabbi and so it's a great honor for us to have this Rabbi with us today and I've asked him to share a few thoughts with us. Would you like to give the rabbi a, a warm welcome? I'm grateful for this invitation, and I feel very warmly embraced in Texas. My wife told me it was 24 degrees this morning and where I came from. <laughs> this morning I would briefly like to go back in our history to the time of the first Passover in Egypt when we were being released from slavery as a people and being brought out to worship God freely. The final event that released us from Egypt was the death of a blemishless lamb whose bones could not be broken either in preparation or even after death the lamb's bones could not be broken. It would render it invalid. The blood from that particular lamb was placed upon the doorposts of the houses and consequently those who were within the house were protected from death. That took an act of faith to do that. Some did and some did not. Many Egyptians chose not to put blood on the doorposts of their houses, but those Egyptians that did joined Israel in life. It was a wonderful thing. Since then, the Passover has been celebrated in various ways through the Jewish communities and there has been a consistent theme developed through the centuries. One of them is to include four different cups of wine in the Passover celebration. The third cup is an interesting one because it represents the redeeming blood of the Lamb. And indeed, in Jewish thought, wine represents two things. One is blood and one is joy. And in the days of judgment, when Moses turned water to blood, it was demonstrated that, as the scripture foretells, Messiah, who will be like Moses, the book of Deuteronomy says, is going to do something similar. And the rabbis, the sages of old said, when Messiah comes, he will be able to take water and turn it into wine because it will no longer be a time of judgment. This is highly significant when you consider the first miracle performed by Yeshua, Jesus, of Nazareth. It was fulfilling a rabbinic expectation, wasn't it? The last Passover he celebrated with his disciples, he took the cup which was directly after supper, the apostle Paul tells us. That, in our ceremony, is the third cup, the one that represents that lamb's blood which purchased our redemption. It was that cup with which he identified his work. He said, this cup represents my blood. 
You know, there's another interesting ceremony that's more than 2,000 years old, and it's still practiced in some communities today. When a young man sees a young lady that he's interested in, he, the arrangement is always done by the fathers, but in essence, the ceremony which cements their relationship into a firm, legally binding marriage involves him bringing a cup of wine to her, and he says to her, the wine in this particular goblet is representative of my very life's blood. If you drink this wine, you'll be mine. You'll be married to me. If she takes the cup and drinks it, that's it. She's now married. I can see the fathers in the room calculating the costs they would save in such an arrangement. <laughs> says, I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to lay down my very life on your behalf. Don't be so fast to push him out the door. <laughs> what we have here in the ceremony is an overlaying of two different ceremonies. The last Passover that Messiah was with his disciples, he was indeed fulfilling the Passover traditions of that day and our day today. However, he was overlaying another ceremony. He was asking his disciples, and indeed those who would follow after, those of you who are seated here this morning, to consider very carefully a proposal, and that proposal is of marriage, to become joined with him in a marriage. By this time in his ministry, there were no more questions in the minds of his disciples. There was nothing unusual or obscene in what he was discussing with them. As he proposed marriage, they were acutely aware this was far more than just a man sitting with them. And I must tell you that they chose very solemnly to drink, knowing what it meant. A bride who became married in this fashion did not immediately move in with her husband. There was a time of separation. This was known as the betrothal period, and do not think that a betrothal is like an engagement in today's society. It's not. The betrothal period could last a year, two years, sometimes three where the bridegroom went back to the home of his father and he would build a place suitable for his bride. And the father who knew the customs and knew what his son's wife would want because his father had been married already would be able to show him what be, would be needed for that apartment or that arrangement. And when the house was completed, the father would say, you now have enough done, you may go and get your bride. And so in a torch-lit procession, most of the time took place at night. It, he would come and they would see him arriving over the hills with his groomsmen. She approximating the time he might be ready for her. They had, of course, corresponded. He had sent her gifts during this time. She, preparing herself for his arrival, would joyously meet him. The one thing about that particular ceremony of drinking wine is that they would not drink of the fruit of the vine together until they were reunited. And the purpose for this was because, as I mentioned, the secondary purpose for wine is joy and its representation. Representing joy, it would never be complete until they were once again reunited. And this is why Messiah, when he took that cup, said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. Beloved, this morning, as you consider what this means for you, please drink carefully, with great thought. The penalty in the Torah for adultery is death, and this indeed sheds light upon what the Apostle Paul said when he said some of you who are eating and drinking unworthily have gotten sick and some have even died. Please live lives as if you are married, once you're married. Don't flirt with the single life. Don't flirt with the ways of the world. Let's pray. May we, Lord God, as we consider your ways this morning, be committed fully to your word and to what it instructs us to do in our lives. No compromise. May we even now begin preparing our hearts for that which comes in the next few moments. For we bless and praise your name, Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. Amen.